My name's John Coulter and I run Shop Talk. Shop Talk is Target's business advice service for customers. I'd like to welcome you along today to this, our first session. It's a one and only session that we're running today and it's called How to Create a Business Worth Buying. It's an ambitious session um, and that's because the topics that we're dealing with are pretty serious. Because one day, whether you're selling your business to realise the money, well unless you walk away from it, let's put it that way, uh, you're going to be selling your business to realise the cash from it to either go and do something else or invest in retirement. And that's a pretty important decision to make. Because one day you're going to put your business on the market and you will get the sum total of not a penny more than the buyer is prepared to pay you for it. So all those years of love and investment and toil and effort and blood, sweat and tears mean nothing to the buyer. So, if that's the case, doesn't it make sense to think about the things that you could do now to prepare your business over the years ahead, so that when you get that point to selling it, you've created a business that's worth, that's worth buying? I think it probably would be, yeah? Okay, so, to help us do that and to understand that, we've got some, uh, some real experts along today. We've got um, Ian Price from St James's Place Wealth Management. You want to stand up, Ian? Just Morning, 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 morning. Ian's along. Uh, Ian and James is also with him from St James's Place Wealth Management, and we've got Luke Rebets from BCMS. Ian and James, as it says on the tin, know a fair bit about money and investments. Stands to reason if you work for a company called Wealth Management, doesn't it? They're here to talk to you about planning for retirement. Why does that matter? Because you need to know now what you need to be saving. Yeah, you need to know now what you should be putting by every month because only that way will you build a pot that will anyway shape, um, help you to have the kind of retirement that you might envisage for yourself. It will also help you understand what you, the kind of figure that you should be looking for when you get to sell your business. That's where Luke comes in. BCMS Corporate, a highly successful business in the market for selling privately owned businesses all around the world, based in the UK. They're in the business of advising businesses just like you what it takes to create value in a business, the steps that you can take to make your business worth more than it is now. And when you get to the point of sale, they can help you through the sale process so that you maximise the price that you get. So two very different perspectives on the same topic and some pretty fabulous advice that's coming your way very shortly. Just before we get on to that, I'd just like to say one thing. This is a 90-minute session. I've already done some talking. We've got two presenters with an awful lot of information to get over to you. Rather than taking question and answers as we go through the session, we'll take them at the end. Now, that may mean that there isn't a lot of time before this session closes. But don't worry, both St James's and BCMS have got stands in the Exhibition Hall. They're right beside each other, so you can go straight from here and carry on the conversations with them there. Or should you find that through the day you suddenly think of something and you want to ask them a question later on, clearly they'll be available for you. Yeah? Is that okay? Brilliant. I will hand you over to Ian. Right, right, right. Oh, right. Delighted to be here. Um, I can imagine sitting there, the thought of somebody talking about pensions, you're gonna, your brain's going to go off, you're going to get bored and all that. My job in the next half an hour is to update you on retirement in the best way possible um, and cheer you up and depress you. So I've got two clear objectives, OK, and I'm going to go through it and you can, you can work out which one's which. Right. Um, I think this year is one of the most fascinating years I can ever, ever remember. Um, I'm also getting very old, so I'm now doing the stuff my dad used to do, so I'm going to pontificate about retirement. I think uh, that we're living in phenomenally interesting times. I can imagine me standing up here in March 2009, telling you that interest rates are going to be half a percent, and in 2016 they're going to go down. None of you would have believed me. The fact that we've, got a, um, we've had the Brexit vote, we've got um, a Labour leadership vote, which is absolutely hilarious, if I'm really honest at the minute. Um, I think it's unbelievable. Every time I see that, it reminds me of the dead parrot sketch 
from Monty <laughs> Python, if I'm really honest. I'm not telling you which way it's going to go. Um, but we've had some real shocks this year as well. I think the biggest shock is Sue and Mel leaving the Bake Off is really upsetting me immensely <laughs> as I go back. And also, Rick Parfit is probably going to leave status quo because if his heart won't last and you think how much drugs he's put in surprise, I'm not really bloody surprised. Here we go. Right, right. Where to start? I'm going to go back to when I started work in 1977. I'm 59, believe it or not. When I started work, you had something called a retirement age. You knew when you were going to retire. Um, you start, it used to be called selective retirement age, normal retirement dates. Um, you got to about 60, 65, you took your tax-free cash, you bought an annuity, and you bloody died at 75. It was a great system. Uh, it was a fantastic <laughs> system. We knew where you were at, and that, that was it. It was a brilliant, brilliant system. Um, today, the world's slightly different. And so funny enough, I've come up from London this morning because I was at a really interesting seminar yesterday, but this is it. Today... No retirement ages. You're all business people. Great news is you can't make anybody retire. Have you really thought how that's going to impact your business? I should say I work for St James Place with a FTSE company. I also am chairman of some charities, so I run small businesses. I know St James's Place can make me retire. It's called a cheque. It's just how big. Right, <laughs> charities can't do that. That's a real big business issue. Next one is demise of final salary schemes. Unbelievable tr things with Tartar, British Home Stores, nothing to do with the business or to do with their final salary schemes. I could talk for hours on that, I won't. Um, you've got amazing choice when you come to retirement. I'm going to show you something here. And retirement could last 25 years plus. Bloody brilliant. Um, you're going to use other assets. Actually, selling your business is part of your retirement strategy. Uh, I've heard something say, my business is my pension, it's part of it. So that's it. Next thing. When you do presentations, you always do, never put up a complicated slide because it's not fair on the audience. Bear that in mind with this. Bloody love it, OK? <laughs> <laughs> that are the choices you've now got at retirement. Unbelievably complicated. Unbelievable. But I'll come back to this because we've got a way through it. Cheer you up. Right, next one. Um, when I started work, you know when you get old, you look back, and I've got two daughters, 28 and 24, there were no mobile phones. OK, some of you are pretty similar age to me. Some of you are so young, can't ever believe it. There were no individual computers and there were no things called sat-nav. Do you play the sat-nav game? It's the best game in the world. You put the sat-nav on and you try and beat the time, OK? <laughs> I did this very recently into Southampton. I beat the time, but I also didn't spot the speed camera. So I've just done a speed <laughs> awareness course in Siren Sester. True story. Absolutely true story. Also, because I think I can do this now, um, I'm on Twitter. Believe it or not, uh, in my job, you have to keep up to speed all the time on Twitter. Do you know James Blunt? Some of you know the singer James Blunt. Do you know he gets an awful lot of abuse? Can I just repeat this one? You're going to love this one. I apologise, there will be a swear word, but I'm in Bradford, so I'm fairly relaxed. In London, you can't use these words, OK? Um, this was a tweet that came in. On my bucket list, I'd love to explain line by line why You're Beautiful is a crap song. James Blunt's response was, I'd like to explain by dollar by, well, sorry, word by word and dollar by dollar why I don't give a shit. Which I thought was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Love that type of response. Unbelievable. But Twitter, can I just be on a serious note about businesses? We had our best ever year in my charitable world, so I'm in Swindon Carer Centre, because we started tweeting. And I think if you're running a business, Twitter is something you need to think about. It's a great communication. Love that. Right, here we go. Next one. I love it because I'm getting old. Um, these companies are brilliant. Did you know Uber is the biggest taxi company in the world and doesn't own one taxi? Did you know Airbnb is the biggest hotel chain rooms in the world and doesn't own one room? Fantastic. My daughters swear by Airbnb. I haven't quite tried it yet, but I'm sure some of you, unbelievable. I think, what's next? I'm sure some of you got great ideas. The business is changing. Next thing, generations are changing. We pay for the previous generation. This is going to cheer you up. So my kids will pay for us a lot. They hate us. OK, and I'll explain why in a minute. My, we pay for my parents' generation. And you've got to get this in your head because it's really important to understand. Next thing, right. The Waltons. Do you remember the Waltons? It's very, every last one you see the Waltons. I don't know why. Um, they were the first people to have intergenerational living. In Swindon, that means something completely different. But I can't go there, OK? <laughs> right. That's a very dodgy topic to get into. Intergenerational living. This is going to become really relevant for retirement planning in the future. And I do think this on a serious note. Uh, I'm going to see a picture of my family in a minute. This is a major factor in our household. Next. I'm going to cheer you up. Department of work and work and work and no pensions is reality for most of us. Retirement age of the future, 70. Fact. Why? Can't afford to retire beforehand. 
Plus, there's another big factor. My, my, um, you go see folk around my wife in a minute. I've been married 28 years. Really? Which, which, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit shocked as well. Bloody hell. <laughs> to the same woman. Fantastic. 28 years to the same woman. There was a. You should sit here more often. Okay, 28 <laughs> years <laughs> to the same woman. Unbelievable. Nicole and I have been happy for three. <laughs> I've only seen her for three. We never see each other. I, I literally, I've been away for a couple of days. I'm literally, I'm apologising. I've got to shoot back and all this rubbish. It's, it works brilliantly. We just recently been on holiday. We had that holiday, holiday thing. Right, hello, darling. How are you? We go for three days. We get to know each other. Three days we like each other. Three days we're really looking forward to going home. <laughs> Did you know the biggest increase in divorce rate is over 60s, and that's a fact. And the biggest thing this seminar was saying last night, there's a massive trend. Why people are working later is financial and social interaction. I will not retire until I'm 70. I can't spend my time with my wife. I love her dearly, <laughs> but I really can't. And she knows this, because we had a dinner party recently, and she said the same to me, which really did shock me, if I really, I thought it was just one-way traffic. No, it's two-way. Okay, next one. <laughs> We're all living too long. We are all living too long. Best example I can use, state pension. Yeah? It's the biggest Ponzi scheme ever in the UK. Why? Because there's no fund. The people, your people paying in today are paying for those retired. It cannot continue. So this is it. So, stats. You all run businesses. Some of these stats are important to your business, really. 2008, 9.5 million, 75. 2033, 17.3 million people will be 75. Businesses will have to adapt. Depending on what your business is, how are you going to deal with an older population? This is a great business opportunity. Barrett Homes are now building homes for the over 55s. And they're building flexible, so you can move the walls around as you get old and decrepit and have a wheelchair. I'm building up a great picture. In Sirencester, where I work, literally opposite my desk, McCarthy Stone are building retirement homes in the middle of Sirencester. On the outskirts of Sirencester, by a place called Dobby's, that market garden centre, they're building a retirement complex of the over 55s. What's really hacked me off, I've been mail-shotted by both of them, which has really <laughs> cheered me up. Rock on, I'm not going there yet. But my... S <laughs> I should tell you about my family. I've got a brother in Bournemouth, I've got a sister in Bournemouth. My brother's a state agent in Bournemouth. My sister runs a care home business. I'm in sort of life insurance. All we need is an undertaker, and we've cracked the market. OK. <laughs> Serious note, I think the way care is going to be treated and later life planning and living is going to change completely. My sister does run a big care home in Bournemouth. She's built a big retirement complex where it's a, a statutory big building. Around the outsides are apartments and flats that you buy, and you buy in care as and when you need them. We've got one of the lowest rates of people moving into retirement complexes in the world at the minute. Um, that will change. Next one. This. Uh, 2014, the Queen sent out 13,350 telegrams. In 1917, 24. There are now 50,000 people over 90 in the UK. This impacts your business and impacts the thought how long your money is going to last for when you retire. Next one. Good news is one in six of you will live to 100. I'm number one. I don't care which way you go around <laughs> the room, OK? <laughs> 2006, half a million will be over 100. Daunting stats. Next one. And I love this. this will be, you'll remember this. 191 people in the UK are still driving over 100. There are 30,000 over 90 still driving. My mum is one of them. She's 92. She drives every day, and this is a true story. She's just had the drive extended, so she doesn't keep hitting the car as she comes in, but she's safe. OK. <laughs> Four million over 70. Can I put your downside of that? My mum's car insurance went from 300 to 900 pounds, and generally she's never claimed. And classic businesses. If you'd like to talk uh, to us about this, could you please email us first? My mum's 92, doesn't know what a computer is. We actually did some negotiation, got it down to 400 quid. My in-laws are alive. They went on to India for a holiday. Travel insurance for them, both 80, 500 quid for two weeks. The world's changing. Next, baby boomers. I'm one of them. I did an article for a magazine. I put baby boomers rock, because we bloody do, OK? Have you ever looked at a photograph of your parents the same as you are now? They look old. OK, they do. Literally, physically. when my mum and dad got to 40, I thought they had died. <laughs> OK? But baby boomers like us, we've got different attitudes. My mum, um, it's, it's a true story, I, I smile because it's true. Every day I phone my mum, every day I pick up the phone, you go, oh, you're still alive then, mum, how are you? I'm not, she's still alive and well. 
Do you know all she wants to do is leave us inheritance? Do you know what I want to do? I was talking to the taxi driver about it on the way over here from the station. Baby boomers like to spend their money on the kids today. I have just funded my daughters, which you can see in a minute, through university, which brings up the family. Right. Why is this irrelevant? Because it's relevant, not relevant. Right. <laughs> it is not, it's relevant. That's the family. Wife and two daughters. Daughter, that one, is just on her way back now to Norwich to finish her last year to become a doctor, which I'm dead proud of. Um, that daughter there is in lead. No, uh, no, she's not. She's, I don't know where she is. Actually, no, she, she's um, in Reading. She's going to become a school teacher. She's on a week's course to become a school teacher as part of a year. Very proud. And my wife at the end is a deputy head of a school. Fantastic. Normal hat family. Only time we've ever taken a decent photograph in our lives. And if you saw it two hours later, we were so absolutely hammered, we couldn't stand up. OK? <laughs> I'm a really nice charity event. Next, my in-laws, 80, still alive and well, living in Swindon. Last but not least, my mum, 92. <laughs> Alive and well, lives by herself, drives every day, cooks every day. My mum's pension is now greater than my dad's income was when he was working, and my dad's been dead 25 years because she had a final salary scheme pension. I thought as a regulator, Jesus Christ, I was out here like a good <laughs> Unbelievable. So in my family, we've got people living long. I know, and I don't mean this nastily, when something happens to either my mother-in-law or father-in-law, the other one won't cope. So I'm reliably informed for my lovely wife, just in case you meet her, they're coming to live with us. The funniest conversation I've ever had with my wife, uh, sorry, with my mother-in-law, trying to explain Sky Plus. Have you ever tried doing that? That when you put pause, you don't pause it for the whole of the UK. It's one of the funniest <laughs> conversations I've ever had in my life. But hey, what do I bloody know? But hey, I love her dearly, and we're going to build an apartment above the garage and put a stair, stair lift in. Okay, right. What you've then got is real generational envy. And this is really important to understand from a business perspective, because you're employing the millenniums. They have different attitudes to baby boomers like me. I'll put this one up. Well, they are the baby boomers, the most selfish generation of old folk there have ever been, and likely will ever be, saga party boaters, free education, cheap houses, final salary pensions, and now spending a lot wearing, bad, some, wearing some bad cardigans, leaving their kids knee, date in, knee deep in debt, struggling to bring up the families. Apologies to the one that broke the mould, but they really are few. And I put up the quote, Leanne and Jessica Price, but it wasn't quite true. Reality is, it's true. I bought my first house in Swindon, aged 24, on a 100% mortgage with no deposit. Did help, my dad was regional director for Nationwide Building Society. Eh, you know, no, it does help. <laughs> you try, have you trained kids to try and buy houses at the minute? Unbelievable, you've got that going on. Next, you see in the press, real issues with generations. And this means, from my financial planning point of view for retirement, I'm helping my kids out today, I'm putting back my retirement. And this, the bank of mum and dad is now the 10th in the top 10 of lenders on house purchase, fact. And I don't know if you see to try and buy a house nowadays, it is really hard work and average they need about a deposit of about 30 grand to get on the housing market. That means people like me are trying to be trying to help pass money down to the kids because I'm being told by my wife that's what I have to do. Uh, next one. Right. I haven't inherited. I haven't. 60. I haven't inherited a penny. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not moaning about it because I'm not. I do go down to mum who lives in Bournemouth and I live in Swindon to make sure one third does mean one third. Got to protect her. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> Popped down for breakfast just the other day to make sure she was okay. Hello, I'm Ian, not Nigel or Susan. Okay, right. <laughs> Next. <coughs> pensioners are rocking. This is important. Depending on what business you're in, pensioners have got a different attitude. You've heard the word ski, spend the kids' inheritance? This weekend, you'll remember me when you pick up the Sunday papers and all you see advertises are cruises. Fact. Why? Because people like me are trying to get back at my kids. My daughters have travelled more around the world than I have. Because when I started work at 14, we didn't travel. I got to Bournemouth and Sandbanks and Paul. That's about it. Didn't Literally, my first time abroad was when I got married for the second time. OK, right. So now, average pensioners enjoy three holidays a year. They're fitter than during their working lives. 50% polled exercise more than their 20s. One in 10 return to education. Eight out of 10 are treated in retirement as a beginning rather than an end. Fact. You then get this. This is the dynamics of the over 65s versus the under 16s. The world's changing, changing dramatically. Recent survey, one in third of retirees this year are providing financial support to their family of 250 quid already. One in seven are 500 quid. What about this? 28% of this year's retirees will, uh, won't be leaving the legacy, will leave a legacy. 
you look at the figures, that's gone from 52 to 28. The generation coming through will be poorer than the generation today. Fact. So you've got a plan for it. Next. It's really cheering you up. Uh, the retirement plans, they are changing. OK, here we go. I call it the glide path to retirement. The cliff edge retirement has gone. Um, it's well known. I do a lot of talks around the UK, and my bosses occasionally come and listen to me. I've got this vision of actually in four years' time, not working five days a week, working three days a week doing this. Two things are going to happen. The other answer is going to be yes, or it's going to be no. Fact. If it's no, I'll go off and do something else. But I won't suddenly stop work. And that's about fear. And I do think this. My father did stop work at 58, because he was not well, and actually died at 65 of a massive heart attack. Tragic case. Why? One of the reasons was, like I said, he hadn't planned what to do in retirement. So this glide path is where, and I think it's good. So if you're running a business, and I'm sure you'll go talk about how you sell a business, do you stay on the business, don't sell, it's all part of your glide path to retirement. And I agree, every asset's up for sale, it's just the price we're negotiating. And I think that's, that's very clear. And the business people I've met, of course it's up for sale, it's just the price. That's, what, that's what all we've ever debated. It's a bit like my house, my wife says we'll never sell our house. Little does she know they get the right offer I'm selling it tomorrow. Because I would, why wouldn't I? would be bloody mad not to. Then I'd be door divorced, which cost me more money in the house. Oh, so I won't sell it. Okay, here we go, next one. What type of retirement do you actually want? Really important question. 64 million dollar question. How much money do you want in retirement? Now, I worked this out the other day because I went on holiday with my wife and we did sit down and have a chat about retirement. I've worked out in retirement, I want enough money to do what I want to do, but I don't want to be a person accumulating more wealth. Does that make sense? So my vision is to get to retirement, kids off my hands, the, the whole conversation with Price Household, it's quite fun. My wife said to me, we'll pay for one degree and one marriage for each daughter. Whew. So far, I've paid for four degrees, not a husband in bloody sight. So if you've got anybody aged between 20 and 60, I'm getting desperate. Speak to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, actually, I will stop work. The kids won't need, and I just want enough money to do what I want. And in a funny sort of way, I know it sounds really weird, I don't think the figure is as bad as you think it is. I waste a lot of money coming to work. I've been in London for two days. The amount of money I spent on bloody coffees in London is a bit depressing. Believe it or not, I spend a reasonable amount of money not on, on suits, shirts, all go. So to me, that's a vision. Two things, just bear this in mind. I saw a figure yesterday that's saying, whatever you want in retirement, you should have a fund of 11 times your final salary. Does that make sense? So if you're on 50 grand, 11 times 50 grand. Great idea, it doesn't really matter, but as long as you end up with what type of retirement, and in fact, we can help with all this, as I'm sure you expect us to say. This is what I'm about, and there's one box that's missing, which is your business. You will have different assets in place to fund for your retirement. I generally believe one of the biggest growth markets will be your business. That will create a capital value, which you can then use and invest to live off. Absolutely fine. Next one is, I think one of the biggest trends you're going to see is downsizing. But proper downsizing. My mum, who I love, dearly in, Pi in Parkston, she should have sold a bungalow years ago. She won't. It's far too big for her. I think people will downsize and release equity out of their houses. If I'm honest, honest, for a lot of people, it's the only get out of jail card they've got. And I'm not being arrogant, I'm not being conceited, it's fact. Running businesses today is hard work. And like I said, running a charity, which is a business, is really hard work. So I think that's what it's about. Next, right. Where are we today? Ten years ago, the government did something which was fantastic. They did a day simplification. They simplified all the pension legislation. It was a piece of cake. Everybody understood it. Since that one day, every subsequent government <laughs> keeps changing the pensions rules, and it's a pain in the what's it. The only good bit about it, it keeps me in a reasonably well-paid job. Yeah, what's in it for me? I've got a job. OK. Reality is, it's complicated. I'll go one stage further. I do not believe what I'm going to tell you today will necessarily be what it'll be in 10 years' time. That's the shifting sands. But what you should do is plan on what you know today, not guess what's going to happen tomorrow. Right, here we go. Two things. How much can you put in and how much can you take out? So what can you put in, what can you take out? And this is part of your business strategy. And I'm not arrogant enough. It's found where your business cycle is, when you're thinking of buying, acquisition, mergers, etc. Right, let's look at the annual allowance. Today, believe it or not, you can put in £40,000 or 100% of your salary, whichever's the lower, and you can get tax relief at the highest marginal rate you pay or the business pays. Does it make sense? You're going to pay it so 
company contribution or to personal contribution. So theoretically, you're saying, Ian, I can put in £40,000. Yes, but. <laughs> OK, sneaky little one. The government have decided to make this a little bit more complicated. They've got something called adjusted income, and I hate getting techie because it's boring. Adjusted income is a real issue. This is basically saying if you take your total income for the year from everything and if it exceeds £150,000, the amount you can put in reduces. And actually, believe it or not, if you're lucky enough to earn £210,000 plus from all sources, the most you can put into a pension now is £10,000. Which, can I give you a quote, is rubbish. So they're really hitting the inputs. I think they'll go one stage further. Like yesterday, on the wire, on my Twitter, where I get all my information from, the government are talking about actually reducing higher rate tax relief on pensions. So if you happen to be a 40% taxpayer, I don't believe in two years' time you'll actually be able to get 40% tax relief on your pension contribution. So if you're, if you're in a position where you can put money into pension, why wouldn't you consider doing it today when the tax rate's higher? Can you imagine if I went down, I've, I've, I don't know where I am, Bradford, which is back somewhere that way, if I went down Bradford High Street and said, if you're lucky enough to be a high rate taxpayer, if you, get, you can invest £10,000, but it's going to cost you £6,000, people won't believe me. Tax relief on pensions is still a major factor for retirement planning. Right, the next thing, so you've got money going in that's restricted. Great news is the money can be out is now restricted because the government likes to do this. Right, now the biggest fund you can have for retirement is a million pounds. A million pounds is a lot of money, but they keep hitting this one. And what we can do, and the guys can here can help you on the stand, we can actually show you based on all the funds you've accrued to date, if you're going to hit the lifetime allowance. Because if you go above the lifetime allowance, you will be taxed at 55% on anything above the lifetime allowance. So let's say you went by, can I use a stupid example because it's the easiest way. Go above by a million pounds, you'll pay tax of 50, 550,000 pounds on that million pounds. Um, I had the pleasure, I do some really nice events on a Friday for some unknown reason. Friday last week, I was in Newmarket really nice. The Friday before, I was in a place called Corby, talking to a group of GPs. They are really unhappy about this, because it's going to impact them. So to me, what it's saying is, say you're 20 years away from retirement, let's just say you had a fund of £474,000, you will be hit by the lifetime allowance. Utopia is to plan to get to about a million, massive figures. But that goes back to how much you want in retirement. This is just at the real end of the saying, saying, good Lord, how much do you put in? Absolutely unbelievable. I keep getting asked, will the government change the rules? <laughs> Can I just say, they're not going to change this up. Why? Don't care. Can I just say, um, the average fund is around about £50,000 of retirement. Now, I'm going to be very brave because I'm going to disappear quickly and I'm going to judge them. I usually say that creates an income of £2,000 a year. Unless you live in Hull, you can't live on £2,000 a year. I'm conscious that somebody might be here from Hull, so I really do apologise, OK? So I once did that presentation in Hull. It didn't go down too well. OK, reality, you can't. But 50 grand is the average fund. It's scary. But as businessmen and women, when you're building up a business, what's the most important thing? To cover the cost of running that business. We could spend hours talking about auto-enrolment, the impact that's happening. But you've got so much coming in. Actually, to make a decision to put money aside can be quite difficult, but it's got to be the right time for you and your business. Absolutely spot on. Pension freedom. So the government said, right, what can you do? Right. The great news is we get back to this one. What options should you consider? They are huge. The great news is this is so complicated but the great news is we can help, right? Now, I'll give you a good example. My mum, 92, as I said, has had an annuity all her life. Nationwide, who my dad worked for, hate my mum. She's outlived every actuarial assumption in the world, OK? So she's got a pension that, unbelievable. So the best hedge against longevity is an annuity. Does it make sense? Because it's a guaranteed amount of money. And bear in mind, your starting point for an annuity is state pension. Don't ignore state pension. Had a conversation with my lovely wife. Again, we think when we get to retirement, our state pension will be roughly worth about 15, 16,000 pounds a year between the two of us. I've worked out that will cover the house. All my costs. Does that make sense? Assuming the mortgage is paid off, that will cover. Don't ignore state pension. It's a really good pension. To give you an idea, to capitalise that, 
to provide state pension, it would be a fund of about £165,000 at least. So in your head, because people just ignore, don't, it's part of it. Today, I'm lucky enough, like you, probably to have a partner. Both of us work, both of us will have pensions. Bring it into the pot. Understand, important. The rest of it, ultimately the hedge against inflation is equity. So a blended approach at retirement is what it's about. But you don't have to do that until you get to retirement. Does it make sense? It's about that. That's that one. Right. Pensions are all about tax planning, exactly what any business is about. Nowadays, you should consider income tax, capital gains tax, inheritance tax. Advice is key. Absolutely right. Because the government changed the rules. And basically it said if you die before 75, there's no IHT to pay on it. If you die after 75, you can nominate who you want your pension fund to go to. Best example, me. Let's assume when I get to 75, that's, I'm going to die at 80. So I don't know why I'm going to die at 80. Actually, I played, do you know this is true? Um, do you know you can go on, there's a website, a proper website, that you can go on to and it will work out your life expectancy. You input the data and it tells you when you're going to die. I find it a great thing to do at dinner parties. I really I found it quite, with an iPad, just passing it round. You then say, well, I'm not going to invite you, you're dead. <laughs> and <that's, laughs> but, and honestly, that is true. And the doctor the other week did it. Um, I think I'm going to die at 89 or something, but I think unit alcohol will slightly miscounts it. Right. But after 75, what I'm going to do, let's say I've got a pension fund of £200,000, I'm going to nominate Leanne for £100,000 and Jessica for £100,000. When I die, that goes to them. They can then draw it down and pay income tax at the rate they're paying on that fund. I met one gentleman the other day who's a grandfather, and believe it or not, he's lucky enough to have a half a million pound fund. He's leaving £100,000 for each of the grandchildren to fund their universities. Lovely idea. But this is all about using the rules to how you want to. And each, everybody's different, does that make sense? So I haven't told my wife I'm not leaving the pension fund to her. But I'll be dead when she finds out she can't kill me, or I did. Right. <laughs> this is also important because some of you might be in pension drawdown already. You can make change the rules already. So we put here Asset Preservation Trust, nomination beneficiary, techie terms. This is make sure you get the right money to the right people in the right time. Does that make sense? Because that's what all pensions are about, retirement planning is about. Right. Next thing. I've been doing this job for a long time, and I like going back. Found this slide from 30 years ago. Three simple steps to financial planning. One, spend less than you earn. Do you know, there's been periods of my time where that was not possible. 28 years ago, I moved house in Swindon and bought my first ever little detached house just before my daughter was born, who's now becoming a doctor. We moved in when interest rates were 9%, and they went to 15%. 15% and I spent nine years in negative equity. I lived on my credit card. Fact. And I think we've got to be, sometimes we get very at, conceited about where we are today when you go back. I think in today's world, for youngsters coming through, it's a tough old world out there. And I'm sure you've got employees which you pay the right level of remuneration. By the end of the month, they are desperate. I heard of one company recently I had a presentation to where the lady admitted that they pay money on a payday but it might not go in until the afternoon. They had one guy who was in the garage, his card would not accept. He had no way of paying, and she had to go down with cash to pay for petrol. Sometimes we lose sight of what life's about. So to me, spend less you earn is brilliant. Next, insure against disasters is brilliant. I bet in your business you've insured against every bloody disaster apart from you dying. Depressing. So if I go back home today, when I get back home, if I get wiped out on a train crash between here and Swindon, what's going to happen to my household? They will be so upset, it's unbelievable, until they find a file called the death file, which is on our filing cabinet, and it is called the death file. As you get older, just say it as it is. In the death file are my wills, our wills. We have actually got lasting power of attorneys already for my kids to look after us if I lose my head. Um, the next thing is, they'll find the life insurance policies. And I reckon after one hour, one hour later, they're going, he was OK, but we'll survive. OK? <laughs> I'm well insured. But in your business, sometimes you are the biggest and only asset. What happens if something did happen to you? And that's how I got sick. In fairness, I've had, unfortunately, a funeral for somebody today had cancer this week, critical illness, or in fact, you die. I is everything in the right place. And can I make a massive plea? Of all the time I do the presentations, the best bit of advice I can give everybody, have a will. And please, can it be up to date? And next thing, and can you please tell people where it is? Because people don't. And they really don't. And update it. Really important. Do you know what? Invest wisely. 
Brilliant. I could talk about investments, but I'm not going to. But I can tell you about one thing. In a big presentation recently, a client came up to me and said, Ian, you've been in the industry 39 years. Can you tell me what's going to happen in the market? You're going, yes, I can. They've got their pen and paper out. It's going to go up and it's going to go down, because it always does. If I knew when, do you think I'd be sitting here on a Friday afternoon in bloody Bradford? Mm -hmm. Give you a clue. No. Okay? <laughs> I love you dearly. I'll be sitting on a beach somewhere, sunning myself, going, I got it right. Reality, that's where the market is. You remember the Friday after Brexit? What did the market do? A technical market term, tank. We were go I'd gone into London to a big client event with some clients who got some serious money with us. Interesting conversation. Nobody would have predicted where the market's going to be today. Fact. So the market is the market. It's going to do what it's going to do. The amount you invest and how you invest it is how much risk you want to take. And by the way, that's you, not us. And people's attitude to risk is different. I'm very lucky. Um, I work for a company, and it's true about luck. I started work for a company called Hamburg Life when I was 16 for a summer holiday job for six weeks. Um, I walked in there and said, hello, Ian. Yes, and like a 20-year-old, can you sign this piece of paper? So I signed this piece of paper. Um, I actually left 26 and a half years later. Okay? The bit of paper I signed was to join a 160th contracted in non-contributory final salary scheme pension. Okay? I started on 1,800 quid a year. I got made redundant 13 years ago, and part of my redundancy package was, by the way, in uh, here's some money, thank you. Um, here's some more money to keep quiet, thank you. And by the way, you can have your pension at 55 with no penalty. So I'm a pensioner with a final salary scheme. Luck. Pure luck. Shrewd financial planning, rubbish. I had no idea at 20. I signed this bit of paper because I told you. <coughs> so what you've got to do is invest wisely. That means for my retirement, now I take a much higher risk on the other money I've got. Why? Because I've got guaranteed income coming in. So it's right, okay to have different attitudes of risk for different investments. Next thing. Um, five key messages. I'm just about on time. Almost everyone has to save for their retirement. You'll hear how you can use your business assets as part of your retirement planning. Very important. If you, accumulate, if you do not accumulate enough, you could run out of money. Fact. If you bear in mind 25, 30 years, you need quite a bit of money to put aside to have a nice retirement. Determine how much you need to save is down to you. What you need at the end, it, it, we can work it out. If you leave it, it costs more money. <laughs> Similar to if, if you started funding a pension at 25, it'll cost your darn sight more to get the same pension fund if you start at 50. So starting early, if you can put money aside, is brilliant. Commit and take plan. Really hard to do. Next thing, um, I'm lucky enough to go around all the country. And I've, we've talked about this all. We've all got a bit bland. I did this presentation fairly recently, and a client sent me this, which I absolutely love and it's the best way to finish because it will cheer you up which is part of my objective depress you and cheer you up and then i drive off into the sunset love this and by the way this is true here's an example of the importance of your actually your tax return hmrc has returned the tax return in a man in each after he apparently answered one question incorrectly in response to the question do you have anyone dependent upon you the man wrote 2.1 million illegal immigrants 1.1 million crackheads 4.4 .4 million unemployed jeremy carl scroungers 900,000 criminals in over 85 pr prisons plus 650 idiots in parliament and the whole of the european commission hmrc said the response he gave was unacceptable the man's response to hmrc who did i miss out <laughs> absolutely love it and i bet all of you wish you could bloody have written that to the tax man as i've just done my tax returns last week so where that gets look my role was to talk about how you can plan for retirement you have got different assets different family circumstances your business may be your biggest asset i don't know one of the things i will say as you build your business you're absolutely right the business is only worth what somebody's prepared to do it i met a solicitor friend of mine and he calls it the ebay test how much could you sell it tomorrow on ebay it's quite a good test as you're building a business creating another fund separate to your business like a retirement fund like in a pensions or ISIS or some other investment vehicle is a good idea why because you never know quite what that business is going to be worth um, to finish on, I have to make an apology due to circumstances I've almost got to go back to go back again because of circumstances this week so I do apologize I won't be around but the guys will be here to help my role is just to give you some ideas some thoughts and give you some name a couple of things one you should congratulate you for being in business I'm a massive fan of small businesses and businesses. It's what's driving the UK economy. As somebody runs a small charity and gets involved in all the regulations around small businesses, it's hard bloody work sometimes. The key to a business I've cracked is to make more money than it costs you to run the business. It's a really simple property. And some people do lose sight of that. 
especially the big businesses. So I'd like to wish you well in your business. Hope you found some of this useful. The guys will be here on the stand to help with any particular questions. And I hope you have a really enjoyable rest of the day. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. It's going to be a hard act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> but seriously, um, some fabulous advice there from Ian. Thank you very, very much. You know, there's loads of messages in there. Um, the biggest one probably is, yeah, what your business is going to be worth, whatever you do to grow and build it and make it worth something in the future, that value you'll never know until you actually sell it. So it makes absolute sense to do that one thing, which sounds so obvious, but could be so difficult to do, which is to spend less than you earn. And to use that difference as soon as you can to start saving and putting it into investments and so on and savings that will help go towards funding that retirement. So thank you very much, Ian. That was fantastic. Um, yes, what will your business be worth when it gets to selling it? What constitutes value? Ian pointed out one of the biggest risks in small business is that the actual value is contained in the person that runs it. And you can't sell that because the moment you sell your business, you've gone. Yeah? All the value has just walked out the door. In other words, the business ain't worth that much. But there are ways around that. And that's why we've got Luke along today. And I'm going to hand over to him now. Um, and he's going to talk about those things. Thank you. Thank you.